Welcome to My Dog Ate My Book Report, a podcast where two weirdo 30-somethings take turns introducing each other to a formative book from childhood the other has never read to see if the magic holds up. I am Ren, they he, and I am probably more of a Leatherman or Swiss Army knife as opposed to a hatchet, though I could, you know, can see the use. And I'm Brandon, he, him, uh, and I, I don't know, I'm like a glow-in-the-dark compass, probably. <laughs> That would be almost useless in this situation. Yep, that's correct. Oh, oh no. And today we are going to be discussing the book Hatchet by Gary Paulson. This is a me pick week, which means I have read Hatchet and Brandon has not. This episode will have many, many spoilers for the book Hatchet. And uh, if you have not read it and are considering doing so and don't want to be spoiled, Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, if you haven't read Hatchet, give us like the the short blurb. What's what's the book about? All right. Uh, Hatchet is a 1986 adventure novel for young adults about a boy named Brian who finds himself stranded in the Canadian wilderness after a plane crash. The book touches on Brian's struggle with basic survival, finding the will to keep trying to survive, and an internal anguish over his parents' divorce, and the secret of his mother's infidelity that he carried with him. There are a few content warnings for this book, self-harm and suicidal ideation. So if a brief mention of that is going to trouble you, I advise not to read the book. Yes, so uh, we will now give you, uh, I don't know, 10 seconds to go read the book now before we spoil anything further. Uh, I'm going to start counting 10, 9, hope you're fast readers, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the first time I read this book, I, I, I'm estimating that it was fifth grade because I have strong associations of it with this reading for pizza program there was like you, you read a certain amount of yeah and you get a, a personal panned pizza from pizza Hut. yeah it wasn't called reading for pizza it, i don't remember what it was called i'm not certain i'm gonna call it reading for pizza though i like that tell us what it was called if you know the answer i definitely was not a hugely voracious reader before this pizza program so I'm going to consider myself a pizza program success story because I was poor and I really wanted fancy pizza. And to me, Pizza Hut was fancy, fancy pizza. So I just read as many books as, as I could. And then I realized I liked reading. Yeah. So go you, Pizza Hut. And, and you liked pizza, I imagine. I did. I always got a little personal mushroom pizza. It was mm. the best. <laughs> So, so I'm pretty sure that I read this book around fifth grade is when I'm going to put it, which puts me around nine years old, which, yes, I know is a little young for fifth grade. Don't worry about it. I was a weird kid. In terms of how, like, my, my memory of it affecting me as a child was that it made me into a little bit of a disaster prepper. I, um, I had a number of situations after I read this book that I, I felt like I was ready for. I grew up in Maine, and this was before a lot of climate change stuff, so I had never seen a tornado, but I was very afraid of them. And I had a plan for where I would go in Maine if there was a tornado. I had a plan for a fire, I had a plan for, you know, survival situation. It it, it turned me into a little disaster prepper. This is my strongest takeaway from, from this book. Did you ever have to deal with a disaster for which you prepped? Oh, not ever. Not once. So, I have now reread this book, and Brandon has read it for the first time. So, I'm interested to know what you thought. I liked it. Oh, good. Thanks for listening to our podcast. <laughs> uh, no, I um, I I enjoyed it. It was it went places I wasn't expecting it to, given its like theoretical like reading level and everything. Certainly. Uh, got more serious at certain points than mm -hmm. I anticipated. Um, cause yeah. Cause like beginning with a, a plane crash, uh, a heart attack followed by a plane crash is yeah. Like not necessarily what I expected to happen in the first chapter, um, of, of a book for sort of this age group. But, uh, I, I thought it was a really, really engaging 
single character story, right? Uh, there's very few characters functionally um, in most of the book, uh, even relative to like um, something like My Side of the Mountain, where like, yeah, the kid's by himself a lot, but he like makes animal friends who are kind of characters. Um, like they don't talk or anything. Like it's not fantasy still, but like their presence is that at, at a certain consistency. That's not as much a part of Hatchet uh, as I was expecting it to um, to be. But but yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> Do you think you would have enjoyed it if you read it as a kid? Um, probably. But I don't think I would have opted to read it as a kid if I were given the choice. Uh, like wilderness survival sort of stuff was generally not my genre. Um, for example, My Side of the Mountain is a book that I only read because I had to in school, right? And I, I really liked that book, but like it was definitely not a book that I chose to read. So um, I think just because of like the genre tastes I had, I probably wouldn't necessarily have like picked it out at, at a bookstore or from the library. Um, but if if I had done that, or if I had had it assigned uh, in school or something, I don't think I would have been like upset. I think I would have uh, counted it as a book that I enjoyed reading, uh, maybe surprisingly so. Right? It wasn't. It wasn't assigned, but it was on the list of book options, um, and and I gravitated towards it because ar- around this same time was when they were hanging up. Please come join the Boy Scouts flyers in my school. And I was obviously not allowed to join the Boy Scouts. And I was deeply upset by this. Because the Boy Scouts, at least in the section of the country that I grew up, the Boy Scouts got to do really cool things like learn how to build a fire and go camping and learn how to tie knots and do survival stuff. Where the the little flyer for the... I, I can picture the flyers right now. They were even color-coded. Like, the Boy Scout one was on green paper, and the Girl Scout one was on pink paper. And the Girl Scout one was advertised as, learn how to bake, and make friends. And sell cookies in front of Kroger. I didn't want (laughs) to learn how to bake or make friends. I wanted to learn how to go to the woods. Uh, So I was... You were specifically not here to make friends. I'm not here to make friends. Unless it's a bird. Anyway. (laughs) so yeah so i i definitely gravitated towards the the survival book because i i had this just upsetness upsetness that's not even the word i I was upset about the boy scouts yeah i i was not technically a boy scout i suppose i was a cub scout the cub scouts is like boy scouts for like not strictly kindergartners but like if you're like six or seven maybe you're not quite boy scout ready yet i don't remember what age i was um like like it was it's it's pre-boy scouts right it's it's there's still some of the like wildernessy things but like it's not quite as involved because it's younger kids there's more of a focus on like some more basic skills uh and things and and i was in it for like a year and I don't remember if I ever progressed to Boy Scout and then gave up pretty fast, or if I just never went progressed to Boy Scout. I, uh, I did not, I did not care for it. I, um, <laughs> I was not an outdoorsy kid. So going, going, going into this book again, I, I tried to before I started the book, I tried to remember just like what I could about it, and the things that stuck out the strongest to me was that I I remembered the sort of fun, innovative parts. I remember when he discovered the water refraction mm-hmm. and, and how to spear the fish. I remember how he started the fire. I didn't remember the divorce or the, you know, moments of darkness. Yeah. <laughs> I I remember this book making me so optimistic. It made me think that I could survive in that situation. And reading it again, I think I would be dead. <laughs> I I genuinely believe that I think my biggest problem in a survival situation is that I think I would feel too bad to kill animals. 
at least certain kinds of animals. I think I would genuinely just like try to find another way and die of starvation. Yeah, I'd be I'd be good with the berries, and then I would struggle. Yeah, I I, w- I wouldn't mind killing fish, but I I think I would. I don't think I would figure out how to catch fish. I I have been fishing a couple times in my entire life and don't know how to do it with a rod and bait and everything. I, I don't think I would ever really figure out how to effectively catch fish without any tools to begin with how how many times would you say you've read hatchet prior to this like is this a you read it one time is it a you read it every year of your life (laughs) i i definitely read it a couple times as a kid um i know that i checked it out of the library a few times uh i know that i reread it uh i want to say 10 or so years ago because I was getting ready to go on my first real adult vacation to Florida and everyone was talking about how you need to pack beach reads and plane reads. I don't know what a beach read or a plane read is, but I went to the bookstore and for some reason, maybe Brian Polson had a new book out at that point, but there was a display of his stuff and I was like, oh gosh, it's been so long since I read Hatchet. I'm going to read Hatchet on the plane to be ironic. Um, (laughs) And that was the the point when I discovered the sequels. But Uh, we will will get into that. Okay. (laughs) You won't believe. You won't believe. (laughs) I, uh... I just, for some reason, I was so so scared of, of getting on a plane. And I do kind of wonder if this book instilled that fear in me but i was so scared of getting on the plane that i thought that it would just be sort of like hopeful irony or whatever that i'm choosing to read on this plane this book about a boy getting in a plane crash if i'm reading a book about a plane crash on this plane it can't crash that would just be too coincidental fate won't do that to me (laughs) yeah well at least um at least it was like an airliner i assume instead of a yeah. Because it's it's important to note, yeah, in this book, the, the plane that crashes is just this little skippy plane. Thing. You know, this happens a lot reading books yeah, about like I kids was, from I was a little prior like... to my own childhood. Because, um, you know, growing up mainly in the mainly in the nineties, I was born in the eighties, but you know. Uh like I grew up in an environment where uh kind of it wasn't as like broadly accepted that kids could just look, like run around and do stuff by themselves, etc. Um, like we, for instance, weren't allowed by our school system to walk to school, even if we were in walking distance, um, because of like concern about what happened, what what could happen if like all these kids are just walking to school every day or whatnot, you know. And and then you read like books from the fifties and sixties and seventies and so on, and like it seems like kids are just able to go do whatever they care to right and so they're kind of a cultural divide i suppose in like the parenting scares of like the 80s creating the um, overly protective kind of 90s suburban life that i lived um <laughs> but i was like do, is this a thing do, do people get their kid like a charter plane with one dude a lot like was that a thing I don't know. That never struck me as odd for some reason. I think it just... Everything that was out of the realm of what would be normal for me, I just assumed was a people with more money than my family had thing. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's normal for, I guess, rich people or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, it, it, it did It did briefly strike me as like, wait, like, how did this, how did this plane situation get set up? Does Brian's dad know this dude, the pilot? Mm. Uh, He could have. They didn't really... Yeah, yeah, it's just not really explained. You know, because the the whole thing is told from this kid's perspective, and he, the whole time he's boarding this plane, he's mostly just thinking about how angry he is with his mother and how, like, just sort of, like, grumble, grumble, I'm going to the Canadian wilderness for the summer, I'm just a, I'm just a New York City kid, grumble, grumble. And so, you know, in his grumbling, he could have just completely glossed over the fact, like, certain facts, like, if the pilot knew his father and this was just, like, a favor or something. Yeah. Those things are irrelevant to his experience that he's, that that we're seeing this story through, so we just don't get to know. 
yeah, he, he's very focused on the problems he was having in his life at the time and not on the possibility. And this is fair. I wouldn't be dwelling on this either. He, he wasn't worried about the possibility the pilot might have a heart attack in the air and die, leaving him to deal with the plane. Uh, this pilot might have a heart attack and die. I should make sure he, that I get to know his next of kin and whether or not he knows my dad. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, speaking of the parents, one of the notes I, I wrote is that I I found it just really fascinating that in this book about wilderness survival, one of Brian's main struggles is with this anguish over his parents' divorce and how that was still in the forefront of his mind, even in this survival situation, which I thought was just really, I, I thought it kind of came from a place of honesty from the author. And it, obviously that's not something I thought about when I was younger, but, you know, if, if you, you know, get depressed sometimes and you, you know, it manifests in so many different ways, but and like on a small scale, sometimes you forget to eat because you're, yeah. you know, thinking about other stuff, you know, I, so very, I don't know. I just thought that it was, you know, it could have been a very simple book about a boy and a hatchet and a plane crash, but there was this other element, which just made it feel a lot more real. Mm -hmm. And, uh. And I know that I personally read it before my parents got divorced because they got divorced when I was around 11. But I'm sure some of the parts about, you know, his parents arguing and such resonated with me. What did you think of... So, okay. <laughs> I... Not only do Brennan and I have a very different, you know, upbringing situation... You know, he was raised in suburban Virginia. I was raised in very rural Maine. And we also have very different uh, educational backgrounds and careers. So my very sciencey training as an adult, sciencey training, that's the official term, gave me this lens of reading it this time where I started... <laughs> being very critical of whether or not Gary Paulson had done his research. Because I'm sitting there, as soon as the snapping turtle comes up and lays its eggs, I immediately started taking notes. Is raspberry growth season in Canada the same as snapping turtle laying season in Canada? I doubt it. And, uh, you know, then I, then I went and looked it up. And they are. They're at the same time. He did his research. <laughs> he, he did a lot of research for this. So. See, the thing that the snapping turtle uh, made me think about was that I just really don't know very much about eggs <laughs> at all. Yeah, was there anything else that really surprised you? Or, or actually, tell me more um, about what you didn't know about eggs. Yeah, I guess, I guess it had, like, the main thing in that case was... The notion that the book says that they're pretty much kind of like chicken eggs as far as once he gets into the shell, right? Like they're the outside is different, but like, and I it is just, I was just like, huh? I it never occurred to me that, that would be a thing. Um, I don't know why in my brain chicken eggs work one way and every other egg in the animal kingdom works a different way. <laughs> uh. And then I started to, like, wonder if there is a similar sort of situation where, like, the turtles all have to lay eggs at a certain point, regardless of whether they're fertilized or not, or, or what. I, I just don't know about eggs. <laughs> I, I just don't. I did like the detail about the texture of the shell and such. I personally was just so curious why he didn't stick the egg on top of the fire and just hard, hard boil it in its own shell. That did seem like an oversight. Instead of just because because what Brian ends up doing is just basically sucking the raw egg out of the shell, and because he didn't have any cooking implements, it's important to note the the reason this book is called Hatchet is because the only tool Brian had was a hatchet, like this little like Boy Scout hatchet sort of thing that he had belted on. Yeah. That serendipitously his his mother had given him. Well, it it 
it obviously is kind of a stretch, but also kind of realistic. You know, you're sending your kid off to the Canadian wilderness, and so you give them this little, you know, tool thing. It's cute. It's like, you know, like a Leatherman or something, you know? Mm hmm I don't know. That, that didn't seem too unrealistic to me. Yeah. They wouldn't have let him on a plane with that thing. That's today. fair. <laughs> I was very excited going into the book because I couldn't remember what he first finds to eat and i with the knowledge i have now i was like oh i wonder if you know he notices a deer eating bark or something because like there's information i have now that actually might make it more realistic that i might survive but yeah in terms of what it would be viable because he does mention birch trees because he uses the birch bark to cut up little slivers of papery fire starter stuff and when you have birches you have this whole gateway to um birch beer you obviously don't have sugar but yeah <laughs> um i i did find it interesting that basically brian did no digging for roots of anything at all there were there was no no tuber action here and that's where a lot of a lot of nutrition might come yeah i guess well, like one of the things that surprised me about the book as a whole and like Brian's journey as a whole um, was that he, he doesn't really build up anything really. Like I've read, I read a lot of books over the years that follow the sort of roughing it to some degree pattern, whether it's things like my side of the mountain or whether it's like Swiss family Robinson, uh, et cetera. And like one of the tropes of those books is often um, the characters like progressively sort of uh, building up their homestead or whatever equivalent it is. So not just the initial like shelter from, from outside and so forth, but also like constructing in some fashion uh, sort of replenishable food stores um, often, which comes with like learning how to grow some stuff nearby. So they have a small garden or, um, I guess Brian does learn to sort of uh, fence in some of the fish. Yeah, um, he, he does that, and he he makes his food shelf. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he kind of stops at, um, you know, shelter shelter from the rain and shelf for food, and then just focuses on, like, building up his tools and skills, and then spends a lot of his time hunting food day to day. For a good chunk of the book, he was just focused on surviving day to day because he knew that the next day might be the day that they find him. So he wasn't in this situation like, okay, I guess this is my life now. I need to make sure that it's a good one. It's just, I need to keep going just one more day. Then they're going to find me one more day. Then they're going to find me. Uh, and then, he, you know, he, he does reach a point where he's like, I don't know when they're going to find me. I need to start being a little bit more, you know, thinking more about my future. I, I do feel like maybe that was part of why I thought the ending was so abrupt. Yeah. Because, you know, by that point I was so fascinated with this problem solving and all of the descriptions of events and the moose was just mm -hmm. great. Uh, that when the pilot just, the, the pilot of the, the secondary sort of rescue ship uh, just swoops down to save him. It was almost a disappointment. I know that it was great for Brian to get rescued. Go him. But I was like, wait, I want to know more about how to survive in the woods. I mean, it feels like it's it's kind of intentional irony almost, right? Because um, that's that happens right after he does finally get the survival kit from the plane, which has all sorts of things that will make his life way easier um, than it has been. But in retrieving the survival kit, he he switches on the emergency transmitter and then gets rescued pretty fast so like there's this this period of elation that he has like all of this uh like freeze-dried food that he can that he can eat for a while without having to necessarily worry about always hunting every meal and um various other tools that will be useful for lighting his fire more easily and doing other things and and then just like He's finally gotten all these resources that he's not had. And then somebody shows up and is like, it's over now. Yeah. 
Like he like he pulls a gun out of the survival pack and he's just like, oh, but I already made a bow and arrow. I don't know if I need this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like especially, it's interesting because like that 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 comes at the after sort of being pushed to the edge quite a bit by the tornado. Right. The tornado um, had just wrecked all of his stuff. Yeah, because because access accessing the plane was only possible because of the tornado. Right. Because they the plane had crashed in the lake and it sank, and then when the tornado blew through, he could see the the end of the tail of the plane again. Yeah, yeah, and so like he had he had gotten himself pretty established and had had a pretty solid system of survival at that point. The tornado rolls through, screws up a bunch of his stuff, but unlocks the the weight of the plane. Well, so that abrupt ending actually does segue us very nicely into just skipping around my outline here which is um sequels yeah yeah tell tell me about the sequels i will but after i tell you a little bit about gary paulson okay do that too all right <laughs> so gary paulson was uh born in minneapolis minneapolis Ooh. minneapolis yep <laughs> one. minneapolis Min- where... minneapolis <laughs> the official illumination entertainment uh city move on <laughs> all the buildings are yellow <laughs> before he was a writer he was an aerospace engineer and he reached this moment where he he said you know my life is perfect i've got the job i've got the family i'm not happy i'm gonna run away to be a writer and then he did which i, I thought was kind of great i the the 30th anniversary bo- edition of this book came with an author's forward, which is where I learned some of this stuff. Um, but in in looking him up a little bit, I I learned that uh, actually some of Hatchet was not autobiographical. He never was lost in the wilderness, but he did spend a lot of time in the wilderness uh, to escape from a sort of dark childhood with his parents always fighting. And, uh, and it was a lot of sort of neglect and running away to the woods to you know running away to the woods to read running away to the woods to uh hunt for food because his parents had alcohol issues and were sort of not uh providing for him particularly well he has a a couple of different biographies the first one is guts the true stories behind hatchet and the brian books which is goes into more detail about all of, all of that stuff and how he pulled a lot of stuff from his childhood into Hatchet. And uh, and he has a, a more recent um, biography that's more about his time in the military because the, before he was an aerospace engineer, he uh, forged his parents' signatures to join the army at age 17. He really did get attacked by a moose, so he was able to write that experience through reality. <laughs> I learned that because I watched an interview with him and he pointed out which teeth he had lost from that experience. Oh no. And Those just seem very ornery. You know, they're they're so big. <laughs> they're just so big. And um he had a quote in that same interview which I felt like I had to write down because I loved it so much. He was talking about how much he liked nature and respected nature and why he wrote so many books about nature because and I quote you can be the most popular person in the world. A bear will still eat your head. <laughs> <laughs> so Hatchet was his first, you know, big, big book that got a lot of popularity. But he did write a number of additional books. Um, Dog Song is another one of them. He got into the Iditarod and wrote a lot of books about that experience mm. and that sort of thing. Um, I was I was deep in. I did a rod lore for a year or so of oh, my childhood. Yeah. And obviously Hatchet has won multiple awards. It won the 1988 Newbery Honor Award, which, you know, when we were kids, the Newbery books were, you know, the books the teachers were always pushing on us. You know, like, this has the big little, little, like, silver medal thing on the cover. You gotta read this one. Do you have that experience? I, I feel like I remember that being a thing. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Newbery, like, just kind of meant that it was... St- Something that I always knew teachers would approve of me reading, uh, yeah. because so many of the things they assigned were that. So like any t- any time that I found one I was interested in that we hadn't been assigned, I was like, "But if I'm reading this, they'll give me a pass. I can just read this in the middle of class." 
and uh, <laughs> they won't mind. Uh, so, so Gary Paulson is like super outdoorsy. Spends his time between, you know, a house in Australia and a house in like a ranch in New Mexico. Uh, he has unfortunately passed away. He passed away last October of heart trouble, which uh, was while flying a plane. Granted, <laughs> yeah, that might have been. That might have been crossing a line. When I heard that he died, I I thought to myself, okay, I need to reread the Hatchet books. I. And that's a little bit how this whole podcast was born. So uh, thank you, Gary Paulson. But the moral of me going into his background is, is you know, he's very outdoorsy and suddenly found all this success with Hatchet. And, you know, obviously people clamored for sequels. And so there were sequels. The first sequel was The River. And the basic synopsis of the river is that the uh, government is super interested to know how Brian survived. And so they send a, I feel like he's like a reporter or a scientist or somebody with him to go back to the spot and just kind of go over everything that he did so that this reporter, writer, whoever can use that to like train survival stuff there was some implication that like it was like military application situation right. stuff there and uh then it turns into another survival situation because there's like a storm or something and the writer guy i feel like he breaks his leg and also is in a coma and so brian mm -hmm. doesn't have this adult figure and so has to survive some more um is However, it like chronologically pretty soon after the first book? Is Brian still? It's like was, a, uh, yeah, like I, use? I don't reread the river, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But uh, mm -hmm. so I don't remember. But it doesn't really matter because the river gets retconned. Oh, <laughs> the third book in the Brian saga, but the second book, time wise, is Brian's Winter, which is <laughs> Gary Paulson going back and being like, actually, Brian doesn't get rescued. There was no transmitter. How does Brian survive the winter? So it just Ooh. continues on. But so he doesn't get rescued. And I love Brian's winter. I didn't reread it yet, but I'm going to. Because um, if you remember, at the end of the book, he gets this windfall of food. A sleeping bag. Yeah. You know, flares. Things like that. So he's got a, a bump in, you know, the potential ability to survive the winter. But it's winter. In Canada. So, if you're looking for more, and you think the ending was abrupt, go get Brian's Winter. It'll fix it for you. Does it address the ending of the first book at all? Or does it just, like, ask you to pretend that the epilogue didn't happen? I don't remember if it's just, like, it has been so and so many days since Brian found the pack. I, I don't remember. I, I don't think it's necessarily, like, a super elegant retcon. Yeah. I'm interested in this uh, Brian multiverse. It's still a retcon that I'm really thankful for. Because I, you know, wanted more. And the river didn't really... I don't know. The river felt like a contrived way to get Brian back into a survival situation. And Brian's winter is just like, wait, I made a mistake with that ending. Let's just keep going. Yeah, n knowing that there were sequels out looking into any of them, I was definitely kind of like, wait, is this like Gilligan's Island where the sequel is just that he accidentally ends up back where he was somehow? Well, that's like the river. And that's fine. Yeah. You know, the river's fine. But I, and keep in mind, I didn't read Brian's winter until I was, you know, in my 20s. So, yeah. and I really enjoyed it. Um, it's also important, important to note like the timing of these sequels. Uh, Hatchet was written in 1986. The River was written in 1991. So I think that I might have read The River when I was a kid, but I don't really remember, and I might not have cared all that much. Was there just the two, or is there more? Well, <laughs> there's Brian's Winter, which was written in 1996. Uh, then there was Brian's Hunt, which was written in 1999. And Brian's Return, I think it's called, which was written in 2003. And I know that I've not read the most recent one. Oh, where's he returning from? The dead? Mm, maybe. I'm not going to tell you. What's he hunting? 
Dinosaurs? I don't think there's dinosaurs in the the Hatchet uh, cinematic universe. Look, I I know what happens in the sequel to 101 Dalmatians. I put nothing out of po- out of possibility on on sequels for things. In terms of other adaptations or sort of legacy of of this whole thing, um there was a movie which I've not seen which was released in 1990. It was not called Hatchet. I had to. I, I tried my very best to find out why it was not called Hatchet, but the internet would not reveal this secret to me. It was called A Cry in the Wild, and I will include a trailer for A Cry in the Wild in our show notes because it is it it is wild. It is. It it doesn't it, look promising. Gotta th- say. There is bear wrestling. He does not wrestle a bear in the book. Having seen the trailer, uh, I think I think two things. I think I can I can safely bet substantial amounts of money on two things having having been true. One, they felt like Brian's situation needed more like overt action um, because he really doesn't like like he has encounters with the an- with various animals, but none of it's ever like a real contest or fight. It it, lo- it looks like they must have written entire chunks of story to sort of involve the parents and the search effort um because they have some people listed in the cast that are clearly not brian they're the parents and they're not no-name people for 1990 though i don't have them in front of me i probably should have one uh, of them was ned ned Beatty. yeah ned Beatty was in it and um there's a female lead as well who was not not a tiny name by any means and, and like brian's parents brian's dad is not in the book functionally um and brian's mom is almost not in the book but the movie made it look like pretty clearly they had added scenes to justify those characters being in the book um which i have to imagine are just periodically cutting back to the search effort and everything uh so that you can have people talking to each other because brian's always by himself like yeah that was my my biggest thought was how does this how would a movie of hatchet work since so much of the structure of the book book is, you know, internal thoughts. Yeah. Um, I I had two thoughts when watching the trailer. There were two different thoughts. My first thought was that I bet this is sponsored by Columbia because he had on this big puffy Columbia all seasons coat, <laughs> and I was annoyed by this because it's very clear in the book that Brian, when he crashes this plane, is wearing a t-shirt, jeans, tennis shoes. And just a ratty old windbreaker. Yeah. Which gets torn up and is almost useless. Yeah. He does not have layers. In this movie, he has layers. He has a t-shirt, he has a flannel, and this big puffy Columbia coat. And I'm like, yeah, Columbia wants us to know that if you're wearing a Columbia coat, you can survive. Yeah. It looked, it looked kind of like Brian was uh, uh, told ahead of time. Like like Brian's mom in the cinematic universe is like... Did you did you dress warmly in case the plane crashes in the wilderness? We don't find you find you for fifty five days. Fifty four days. Fifty four days. <laughs> yes, mom. Okay, honey, have a good trip. Like, geez, she's always <laughs> on about crashing in the Canadian wilderness. <laughs> the Ugh. the second thing I noticed was that he screams a lot. Yeah, well, they had to have the cry. Well, the the trailer seems to be all about Brian finding his manliness in the woods. And his, you know, big manly screams, as opposed to, you know, Brian yeah. finding his will to li- Maybe. live and finding his humanity in the woods. Uh, one of the things you said to me before you started reading Hatchet that I wrote down uh, was the fact that you seemed to be going into this book thinking that it was more about someone going out into the woods and roughing it rather yeah. than it being an accident. That was my assumption. So I'm I'm curious how well a why you thought that and how you felt about it once you realized that was not the situation. Um I thought it because a lot of books that I have read uh are more like kid runs away kind of things or even if it's not fully intentional certainly not pilot has a heart attack and a plane crashes. Um so that's that's why just kind of like the the preponderance of the tropes that I had experienced and things I have read that are in various ways tangentially like Hatchet um, in the sense that they're stories about kids surviving without adults. Um, 
and you know to a certain degree i kind of didn't expect it to as i said earlier like go to uh uh something as dark as the pilot of the plane having a heart attack right in front of brian uh and then crashing the plane and everything which probably i should have not been super surprised because i uh I read and even have on my list of maybe a thing to do someday. Flight 116 is down, which is just a plane crash book. So, Oh, because I was thinking about adding a live to the list. Have you read a live? I haven't read a live. <laughs> we are weird kids. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that's kind of why my assumptions were such. Um, once it was clear that was not the case, I don't know if that necessarily like dramatically changed the story per se. Um, for me, uh, I guess the possible exception is that, like, in some things, like, I think my side of the mountain um, and some other stuff, like, the the hero isn't necessarily separated from civilization, right? Like, they can they can go back if they want. Like, I think I am I am invoking my side of the mountain a lot because it's the, you know, wilderness survival one that I, ha- I had read. Um, uh, and I think in that he eventually, like, starts going into nearby town and like occasionally stopping in a general store or whatever. Um, so like the separation from civilization is partially self-inflicted and everything. It's not like he's lost and, and like on his own and stuff. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's because the kid is kind of hiding out and doesn't want to be found. Right. But like not literally separated. So that element where it was like, there, there is no safety net for Brian. He's, he's so far out into the wilderness that like, it, any any effort he could make to get back to civilization himself would be a terrible idea and he would not survive it um so that's kind of the the element that i didn't necessarily expect to be in the book um yeah you say you say that it's a very dark book and i i agree with you yeah but going into it i just i didn't have the memory of it being a dark book i objectively knew that a pilot dies and yeah that's yeah that's some intro darkness but for the most part, my memory of it was exciting, like learning to survive situation. I had completely wiped from my memory Brent's suicide attempt, yeah. which happens, I feel like about halfway through the book. Um, when that happened, I just, I, I sort of like set the book down for a minute and I was just, holy crap, I, I don't remember this part. This was yeah. hard. <laughs> Did you, um, in researching... Paulson, did you find any indication of whether or not he had ever experienced uh, suicidal episodes or anything like that? He didn't uh, say that so much, but he did talk about experience with depression. Yeah, because you mentioned earlier that like you found the uh, in the book where the book talks about divorce, um, you had said that felt very. Uh, true to your experience um it was just very very real and honest to have this character not only thinking about the survival situation he's also thinking about the things that were causing him to have mental health issues before he got into the situation yeah so And, and as a person who has at various points in my life uh had suicidal ideation and self harm impulses and stuff um, I, I found the portrayal of it in this book fairly accurate, I suppose. Like, it's not easy to read, right? Um, and it definitely has, like, like, Brian feels really ashamed of himself for it, which I think if you're maybe not experienced with these feelings can seem kind of, like, belittling the feelings, but, and I don't know, maybe some people still read it that way. But, like, I, I, I find that a sort of critical observation in what happens in this kind of thing when people are experiencing this sort of depth of, of depression um, that like in some ways, in, in some ways like surviving, it makes it worse almost at least, at, at least for a time. And Brian uses that to kind of bounce back. And that's great. I do not enjoy it when people put suicide or self harm into things for shock value. And I don't feel like this was put there for that. I feel like this was put there as a very realistic path that someone's mental health will go on in this situation yeah because i think it's totally reasonable regardless of your prior mental health right um that at a certain point if you're living out in the wilderness struggling to scrape by day to day not sure if you're ever going to be found 
Uh, I think at that point in the book, Brian had kind of reached the conclusion that he he should not ever assume he would be found. Um, you know, you do start kind of analyzing, like, do I do I continue this struggle until something bad happens? Um, at the risk that that my my ultimate fate will be really terrible, right? Um, you know, it might it might be starving to death or or drowning or like you know a, a a wound getting severely infected, like like all these things that would be like an agonizing way to die, right? Um, I, I I think at a certain point you're like, do I want to risk that or do I just want to like end this on my own terms because I think that like no one's going yeah. to come in for me, right? I I do find it very interesting how much that section of the book is sort of sticking with me now, where I just forgot about it from reading it as a kid and I just sort of glossed over that part like it didn't it didn't resonate with me when I was nine it just I just kept going like like yes it's time to read about the fishing now yeah I don't think I would have really understood it yeah so well so that does segue I I have said the word segue too many times I'm looking forward to seeing what your word of the day is going to be when it's one of your episodes (laughs) uh is that uh, one of the legacies of this book and something that is actually very current event related is that, uh, you know, as of right now, it's, you know, February in the United States and there is a lot of in-school book banning and censorship Mm. happening. It's 2022 if, if you come to this episode, like, years from now. Uh, so yes, a lot of these banned books are obviously centering on race issues and LGBT issues. However, uh, this one of these groups that is heading these these book banning lists has also included Hatchet mm-hmm. on the list, uh, partially because of the attempted suicide. However, the primary reason they have a problem with this book is it talking about the divorce. And oh. how it paints the mother in this bad light for the infidelity. Okay. They, you know, they they tick the suicide in there in their list as like, yeah, this this shouldn't be shown to the kids because yeah. of this, but primarily, it's because the boy doesn't like his mom because they're getting a divorce. Okay, I mean, I'm I'm always going to have a hard time agreeing with book banning. So yes, absolutely. I guess I guess the fact that I'm like. Not really on the same page with that. Uh, I, I I would much more understand if the suicide thing was their key. That I wouldn't necessarily support it, but like it is it is pretty blunt. So like I could understand that at a certain age you would want to maybe not want a child to run across it, but it's not it's not a bannable offense. Yeah, but you know we we just talked about how you know when I was a kid I barely noticed it. It didn't traumatize me. It barely registered. Yeah, like that. Like that's kind of. When, when, whenever the talk is going on about banning books for that kind of content, it's like, yeah, I, I by and large, I'm like, I wouldn't understand that. Uh, I, I wouldn't understand that enough to be hurt by it. Um, yeah, you so, know, or so, if we really step back and like look at other things that aren't books in children's lives, like, you know, there's lots of lots of other sources they might encounter this, not not just this book. Yeah. So it is on the banned book list in uh, Tennessee, and it's on you know other yeah. other proposals from from some of these institutions. So yeah, before we get on to our our fantastic rating system for this book, do you have any other sort of final thoughts about about Hatchet? Things you liked about it, things you didn't like, uh, how you think you might survive if you were 13 in the woods in Canada? Oh, I would die. But I will say that, like, the thing that I was sort of screaming in my head the entire time, and probably the thing that I would spend a lot of my time trying to do from the get-go was, like, get to the plane. Um, Like, I know that the plane was, like, submerged too much or whatever, but if I were in this situation, I I I would probably be, like, my only hope is to get to that freaking plane and get the freaking survival pack. I either accomplish that somehow or I die. And probably that would mean I would die. That's probably what would happen. I agree, but at the same time, I understand why he kept pushing it out of his mind. Because he kept thinking of the fact that in this lake, 
was a dead body. Yeah. And every time he thought about it, he deliberately kept pushing it out of his mind. And I yeah. feel that. I, and, and I... Once, uh, on, on the farm that I grew up on, uh, once I got to a certain age, you know, I had a certain task, and that task was that I was in charge of gathering the eggs from the chickens at a certain time and going in and making sure they were fed. One day, I went in to gather the eggs, and I saw one of the chickens was dead, and I ran out, and it took me hours to get back in there and get the eggs and try not to stare at the dead chicken, and it was scary. Like, it was my first experience seeing a dead thing, and it, it was just horrifying, and it was really hard to face face it, and so I definitely understand a 13-year-old boy not wanting to swim down to the bottom of a lake where he knows there's a dead human. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a child, a friend and I found um, parts of a dead bird in the backyard and brought them inside to eat. <laughs> I don't know why that tickles me so much. We... <laughs> we, ha we we debated over who got the head and who got the wing. My mom, my mom shut that down. My mom was not a fan of that. Um, but yeah, I I also as a as a person with um, I would say a mild case of submechanophobia, the plane might have been insurmountable. A lot of the things I liked were the same things I liked as a kid. I just loved the you know the innovation it's hard to say something's innovative when you know he's making a bow and arrow like mm -hmm. that, that's he and he even says it in the book like i'm congratulating myself like for something that people have done for thousands of years but it's it was it's it's fun seeing those moments of triumph i yeah in the process of yeah. like working from a thing that doesn't work to a thing that does work i i liked how part of the way through it starts time skipping around from, you know, suddenly at a point where, uh, I, I forget precisely how it goes, but he, you know, one chapter ends and then a chapter starts where it's, you know, like a month later. And then like another chapter will be him remembering a few weeks ago when, you know, he got sprayed by a skunk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I liked the, the format of the time skipping around like that to emphasize certain mistakes as he, as he was calling it. Well, and I imagine it kind of is also there, I, I suspect, as partially like kind of trying to give you a sense of how little time makes sense anymore at a certain point. Oh, yeah, that's a really good call. And I, I don't think that there was really anything I didn't like. I didn't, you know, there's often things that you revisit as, as something that you loved as a child and you revisit it now and you're just like, ooh, that's problematic. Ugh. But there wasn't anything here that did that to me. And I was really thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and certainly I think your mileage may vary as far as like the handling of mental health in some cases and everything, but overall I agree. Yeah. So uh, for me, I really enjoyed it. I am a person who tends to really thrive on like dialogue. So I, I, I missed that a little bit in a general sense, but all the same, I had a lot of fun reading this book. So minor complaint. So, how many giant peaches were you gonna give this thing? Uh, what is our? What exactly is our scale? Is it out of five? Is it out of? I mean, an it can be a number. I mean, how many? How many peaches are in like a like a bushel of peaches? Is, is bushel even the? I don't know. I, I, what do you call a group of peaches? I think it's. What do you call a group of peaches? I think a group of peaches is a is a is a, is a Georgia. <laughs> Why don't we go with five? <laughs> um, I'd go like three and a half giant peaches. That's fair. I I have two two grades. Okay. I'm gonna give it four and a half giant peaches if you don't include Brian's winter. Oh, I see. So if you're just taking it as if you're a just taking work. it as a complete work because it ends so abruptly. Sure. But if you include Brian's winter, which gives me so much more of that good survival action that I wanted, yeah. it's five giant peaches. I wonder if Brian's return is about him going through a lot of therapy. <laughs> the, the, it, there is talk of him going through therapy. Yeah, I think the epilogue mentions it in passing. Um, That's kind of what that felt like. Thank you all for joining us on episode one of this here podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
Next so, time will be a Brandon episode. I have chosen as my first pick another harrowing tale of survival uh, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler by E.L. Konigsberg. Um, I'm only slightly joking about it being a harrowing tale of survival. I think it'll <laughs> compare to Hatchet in some weird ways that I am looking forward to. It's one of my favorites. Go check it out um, if you want to be able to read along with us. I haven't started it yet, so I'm fascinated by this description. There is a reason that I picked it as my first pick, and that is because there are certain superficial similarities to Hatchet. Okay. I also think it's sort of like a an interesting little note that you know maybe we'll touch on a little bit more that I'm reading all of these books as physical paper books because I am slightly leaning towards a Luddite in terms of book content. I don't like reading my books digitally. Yeah. And Brandon, I think, is reading everything. I'm basically reading everything digitally, um, which is not because I necessarily like it better. I do prefer reading physical books, but um, I got tired of owning a bunch of physical books, except for like the things I really love. Uh, I just am really prone to cluttering my apartment full of tons and tons of books that I like okay or haven't read yet, but have owned for six years. Um, I just decided, you know what? These don't bring me joy. I'm going to give them away to kids or <laughs> for some of the not for kids ones. I'll just like stick them in one of those little free libraries or something. The music used in this podcast was licensed by Epidemic Sound, and the transcripts were generated by otter.ai. We have a question or comment for the team? You can find us on Twitter at, at @dogatemybookpod and on Instagram at mydogatemybookreport or by emailing dogatemybookreport at gmail. We would be super excited to know what books you love to read. Thanks for listening and sharing in some uniquely portable magic with us. That's a Stephen King joke. And uh, yes, like I said in the intro, we're definitely going to be reading some of his because I'm a Mainer and it's a requirement.